Now, ladies and gentlemen, I invite you to enjoy the petitioners or how to build a great university in 225 short years. Performed by UMB St. John's own Scott Thomas and Chelsea Kuzak, narrated by our own Dr. Thomas Condon, Vice President Emeritus, UMB St. John, and written by Scott Thomas, and featuring narrative excerpts from the book, A Pictorial History of the University of New Brunswick by Susan Montague. Scott? William? Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It's wonderful to see so many uh, here uh, this evening and so many old uh, friends from uh, Fredericton and around the uh, uh, province. Uh, Scott Thomas uh, phoned me up uh, a while back and said, look, we're going to do this uh, production and we'd like you to uh, do something. He said, I don't want you to act. I mean, perhaps he said, you can't act, uh, but I want you to do the narration uh, of this. Uh, well, you know, Scott wrote the thing. He directed it, produced it. He's uh, one of the two major leads in it. Uh, he's the boss. Uh, I said, sure, whatever. You know. uh, and then this afternoon when we were having a, a run-through of the script, uh, Scott said, of course, we don't have an introduction to the play. Maybe you could sort of improvise something. <clears throat> I thought that was dangerous on his part, but he persisted. Uh, and I said, okay. Uh, and, um, you know, I'm only... Uh, been around UNB for 48 years, so in the long life of this institution, it's just, you know, a drop in the bucket. Uh, but I've seen uh, three, at least three celebrations of our beginnings, and we actually have four. Uh, we have the petition of 1785, we have the College of New Brunswick in 1800, we have uh, King's College, uh, the uh, successor to the College of New Brunswick in uh, uh, 1829. And then we have the University of New Brunswick, the successor to King's in 1859. I mean, I think the university just likes to party <laughs> and, to, <laughs> and to celebrate uh, its past, uh, which I think is, uh, is really quite a wonderful thing. And we're really here this evening uh, to celebrate 1785 because of the late Colin B. Mackay, former president that many in the room will know and remember. Uh, Colin was a great uh, history buff, not always a great respecter of historical facts, <laughs> <coughs> says this historian, uh, but nonetheless, uh, a man who loved history and uh, felt that the University of New Brunswick needed some brushing up uh, on its history, and uh, uh, and he and uh, Alfred Bailey, the former Dean of Arts, uh, had a wonderful time in doing things with uh, UNB's history. And they thought that the petition of 1785 marked an excellent beginning. Mind you, there were no graduates until 1828. Never mind. 1785 is a very good date. Uh, <laughs> and not only did he think it was a good date, he got the, Ameri the Canadian Association of Universities and Colleges to accept that 1785 was the birth date of the University of New Brunswick. Well, um, most universities, and I have studied a lot of them, uh, really prefabricate about their you know, beginning years. Uh, and so 1785 was sold to the AUCC and 1785 is the birth date of the University of New Brunswick. The birth date means only something when you go to represent your university at the installation of a new president. And then you have to line up in the order of your age. And that means that UNB comes directly after Columbia University and Princeton. And we are the oldest English-speaking university in Canada. <laughs> 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 
So in taking off our hats to the uh, founders and, and to the petitioners, I think we should also take off our hats to Colin B. Uh, Mackay. But the play awaits, the actors await, uh, and let us begin. It is nothing short of astonishing that the loyal adventurers who signed the petition that led to the establishment of the University of New Brunswick put education ahead of other needs. Evacuated the previous year from the relatively cultured colonies where they had refused to support the revolution against the British crown, these men and women and their families found New, Brunswick's, New Brunswick a wilderness inhabited by barely 3,000 English, Acadians, and native peoples. New Brunswick's major settlement, St. John, was a trading village of some 400 inhabitants who, while not pro-American, were for many of them strongly anti-loyalist. Let's meet uh, two of these brave loyalists now. We'll travel back in time through the magic of theater to a humble living room in, in the Payne residence in St. John. This is the home of one Dr. William Bill Payne and his wife, Lois. Lois! Lois, honey! Did you see where I left my coin purse? Lois! What, Bill? My coin purse. Have you seen it? Did you check your coat pocket? Of course I checked my coat pocket. It's the first place a person checks when their coin purse is missing. Bill, I wish you would be more careful with your things. Don't you think that I wish that too, Lois? Please, just help me find it. It's always something just as I'm heading out the door, especially when it's men's club night. I always hate being the last person to arrive on men's club night. Oh, well, I wouldn't want to make you late for your precious men's club night. Lois, could we not get into men's club night again, please? Okay, fine. We won't get into men's club night. Good. Don't even know why you need a men's club night. Oh, here we go. Lois, moving here from Massachusetts has been extremely stressful for me. Working the pioneer lands of New Brunswick has not been the rewarding, enriching life experience promised to me by the men of the Loyalist Recruitment Office. It's made my medical practice extremely difficult. Oh, how so? Well, back in Massachusetts, one would walk in a very relaxed manner across the street, waving at passers-by, maybe even taking a detour into a local cafe or library, on the way to see a patient and, and maybe even a pot of tea. And now? Now, in New Brunswick, I must hike 10 miles of rugged terrain past inhospitable American sympathizers to our nearest neighbors just to make sure that we're no longer the only ones left here. Mm. And of course, there's always the walk back. Hiking is entirely overrated. And of course, there's all that exhausting underbrush. Oh, oh the underbrush. The underbrush. It's, it's just disgusting. Is, I can't believe anyone walks bushes, anymore. I, just, trees, I don't know. I, try to look through but I get birds in my buddies. shoes. Anyway, I understand now why they were so quick to remove all of it from Massachusetts and all of its amounts. Anyway, men's club night is the one night I get to relax. Oh, I'm so sorry you feel stressed, <laughs> but I don't suppose I need to remind you that this was your choice. Oh. You insisted we must maintain our loyalist ideals, and here we are. How are those ideals working out for you now, Bill? <laughs> Yes, yes, I know, I know, our loyalist ideals, I, it was a movement, I guess you sort of had to be there, mm. uh, but uh, you know, we, we both agreed that we strongly believed in those loyalist ideals. Sure, yes, it's just that no one told me our ideas will be so covered in sap and pine needles. Yes, touche. Mm. Oh, here's your coin purse. Oh, oh, thank you, Lois, you're such an angel. I know. The desire to hold fast to traditional values was both tested and reinforced by the circumstances in which the Loyalists found themselves. As historian Catherine McNaughton observed, quote, it's doubtful if they all realized before their arrival just how difficult life in this wilderness was to be. For those who were cultured and town-bred, 
Pioneer Life was to demand a very heavy price, taking toll of their energies, cramping their ambitions, blighting their literature, and modifying their incipient uh, institutions, end quote. It is sometimes uh, in such extreme circumstances that people cling most tenaciously to their ideals and traditions to justify the sacrifices that they are making. So it would seem to have been for the loyalists of New Brunswick, and so it would seem to, to be for Bill and Lois Payne. Let us return to their humble and slightly anachronistic home, uh, where Lois has noted some rather troubling behavior in her sons. Bill, darling. Mm-hmm. Now, don't get too upset when I tell you this, but I found something today in Bill Jr.'s room. Uh, <laughs> has he been making slingshots again? <laughs> oh, that little rapscallion. No, not quite. Now, don't get upset. Well, that's the second time you've told me not to get upset, which indicates to me that I probably will be getting upset. So you would better just tell me, what did you find in Bill Jr.'s room? I found some <clears throat> literature at the bottom of his dressing closet. Literature? What kind of literature? Maps? Poetry? Ballads? No, it wasn't any of those. Oh, dear. He's been looking at the catalogs with the pictures of ladies' bustles, hasn't he? Mm. I knew that when those bustles got really big, it would corrupt our youth. No, Bill, it wasn't bustles. It wasn't bustles? Well, then what was it? Now, don't get upset. Stop telling me not to get upset. It makes me very upset. What was it? It was pamphlets from a pro-revolutionary support group. What? I knew you would get upset. I'm not upset. You have to understand, Bill. Now that we are here in New Brunswick, our boys have so much unstructured free time on their hands that they are bound to discover some level of interest in bad influences as revolutions and such. What happened to all the British toy soldiers I gave them? Oh, our children. They are not boys anymore, Bill. They are young men, and they are looking for more structure than we can provide them at the moment. All we can provide them is the unyielding struggle of pioneer life and a seemingly endless supply of hardtack, suet, and maple syrup. A young man is bound to experiment with such things like revolution. Oh. Well, I suppose you're right. And of course, it is hard for them to play with the other young lads since the long, arduous journey to the home next door takes so much time that they must immediately turn around and begin the long, arduous, dangerous journey back home without so much as a hello. And then there's the underbrush. Oh, oh the, the underbrush. It's so thick. I don't even I, know how they sometimes survive. Sometimes I don't know if I need I've an axe or a machete, perhaps. So Maybe I'll burn it, it if just I, gets stuck I, in I don't my know what hair. to do. It's I just need awful. Sort of buggy or and of course... <sighs> There are all those things written by the bloggers. The bloggers, Lois? <laughs> Pardon my slang. I meant those teams of British logging men who spent too much time on their hands and they have opinions coming out of their ears. They have been writing all sorts of things about the loyalists and posting them on their logs all along the information highway. The information highway, Lois? Yes. The footpath from here to Fredericksburg. Those British loggers post their information along the trees on that highway. Our sons are out there on their own. Who knows what logs they are reading? Well, what about Norton? Isn't Norton supposed to protect the boys from these very things? Why do I pay for Norton if he doesn't? I'm afraid our manservant Norton just can't keep up with the boys. They take so quickly to the information highway that Norton, he just he can't keep up. And at this time of history, there are none faster than Norton. I heard that our neighbor recently obtained a new manservant named McAfee, but they run almost at the same issues. Oh. Well, it seems as if in this modern world there are a few ways to protect one's offspring. Yes, Bill, and I hesitate to remind you that the Wolverine attacks have been steadily increasing. Yes, yes, I know, I know. I need to do something about the Wolverines. Mm. You don't need to nag me about the Wolverines. I will get to the Wolverines. But that's what you said about the Badgers. And Bill Jr. was chased up a tree by one just this morning. And of course, there's the underbrush. Oh, oh the, underbrush. the underbrush. I don't know if it's the I really don't grass understand. It's everywhere. Maybe I, I should I wake right up in the morning and I've underbrushed my teeth. It. It'll, it'll, I have it uh, with the scissors. Large it's scissors everywhere. is what I need. 
All right, Lois, Lois, I agree, I agree. Something needs to be done for the boys. Well, I know it's rather obvious, but perhaps we should consider formal schooling for young Bill and William Jr. Schooling? Of course, Lois. That's an excellent idea. <laughs> While the decision to establish uh, an academy or school of liberal arts and sciences might at first glance uh, seem extraordinary given the rigorous conditions faced by the 14,000 loyalists who settled in New Brunswick in the 1780s. In fact, it was completely in keeping with what they had hoped to achieve in their new home. Prior to the loyalists' arrival, there had been little provision made for education by the 3,000 widely dispersed English, Acadians, and native peoples. Books were scarce and schools were conducted intermittently in private homes uh, by tra traveling teachers who could pass on only basic skills. Schooling, of course, Lois, that's an excellent idea. You said that already. Oh, did I? Mm, oh, yes. Okay. Uh, never mind. Um, I see now that the boys are in need of a very strong education. I can relate to their dissatisfaction. You know, Lois, I had a very troubled adolescence myself. Really, Bill? Yes, I vexed my parents terribly. They were terribly vexed. I went through a very dark chapter where in social situations, I would point at someone's shirt and say, you there, there is something on your shirt. And then when they would look, I would not only really flick them on the nose and cry, I made you look, sir. Being undisciplined, I fell easily into the whole shirt-pointing, nose-flicking subculture. There were some very dark days for me. Even now, I can hardly pass a shirt without the desire to point at it. Ah, well, whatever did your parents do, Bill? Well, my parents had an intervention on my behalf. Luckily for me, they helped me back towards my education, and it set me straight. <laughs> my hard-living, shirt-pointing days are now well behind me. <laughs> now look at me. I'm a Harvard graduate and a physician. Mm, but not a specialist. <laughs> now that is your mother speaking. You know, medical school is very difficult, Lois. It's always something with you too, isn't it? No, oh, Bill, I know this is an enormous coincidence, but we just received a parchment paper. What a kind recruitment. of parchment paper? A recruitment yes, parchment paper? from Aberdeen. Aberdeen? The school you were trained as a physician, but not a specialist. My, my, how lucky for us. Hmm. Yes, it was rather oddly convenient, seeing how it ties in so specifically with what we are talking about right now. Anyway, it arrived this morning with the quarterly mail, hardtack, and sewage delivery. <laughs> mail delivery every quarter of the year. What a world we live in. <laughs> Surely an education for our sons abroad in Europe would lie well within the financial means of an average upper-middle-class New Brunswick family such as us. <laughs> What an odd way to describe us. <laughs> well, hand that recruitment parchment over to me, woman. Ha ha ha, there it is. Yes, I see this is from my old alma mater, Aberdeen. I'm just going to send them a quick B mail. A B mail, Bill? Yes, Lois, the new boat mail service. Oh. Amazing the modern age we live in. I will just use my I quill. I mean that, of course, in the sense that I own this quill. And jot down a quick message. Thanks to B-mail, we should have an answer in no time at all, perhaps even as quickly as two or three years. Oh, my. Well, there were certainly uh, suitable schools in England, but the cost of educating a child there was prohibitive to all but the wealthiest of families. William Payne was a Harvard graduate and a trained physician but not who, ha who had served with the British Army uh, during the American Revolution. Payne was an outspoken loyalist, calling the American uh, patriots a set of cussed, venial, worthless rascals. <laughs> Lois Payne was distressed by the primitive living conditions and fearful for her children's proper education. We uh, returned to the Payne re residence two or three years later. <gasps> You've got mail! My goodness, that was fast. <clears throat> I'll read it. Dear alumnus, Thank you for your inquiries. We hope to see you at the annual upcoming Aberdeen alumni event entitled, Guess Who's Still Alive Who Went to Aberdeen? Well, that's nice. Oh, fun. And of course, our annual Under the Sea Alumni Ball. 
We are pleased that you have inquired with us about the possibility of having your two sons attend in the fall semester and commute here to Aberdeen from the colonies of New Brunswick. As a university, we are always deeply concerned about issues of retention and recruitment. <laughs> I'm sure that's just a passing trend. Oh, yes. Of course, we are extremely pleased to offer admission to both of your sons. Please see below the cost of four years of tutelage and residence for uh, two first-year students at our campus as listed below. 500 pounds? The venal rascals! Bill language! I'm sorry, darling, it's just my father told me that the cost of education would continue to escalate, but I don't think every, any of us ever expected to pay as much as 500 pounds for two people for a four-year education. Whoever thought it would be that expensive to get into university? Oh, my goodness, yes. Well, that settles it. I'll educate the boys myself. Homeschooling. Bill, what will the neighbors say? Who knows? They're over 10 miles away. Mm. Of course, there's all that underbrush. Oh, oh the underbrush. it's so thick, and in the winter, there's know, snow on the I top. You have to push through. I need a dog it. or a horse or something. With, teeth, something that will chomp on it. Maybe a, a flock of sheep or something. Oh, I don't know. Bill, at the risk of being called a venal rascal, may I ask you, do you really think you have the skill and patience to educate our two boys? <laughs> Lois, I'm a physician. But not especially. Oh, I hate your mother! The venal rascal! Language, Bill, language! Sorry, Lois. Nope, you must send the boys to me. For surely, a man who graduated Harvard and then fought for his country as a doctor. But never especially. That's enough! Shh. A man who brought his young family from England to the colonies. A man who refused to be part of a treasonous rebellion, and at great personal risk of life and limb, then once again moved his family to the unforgiving wilderness of New Brunswick, where he must continue a daily struggle against dangerous flora and equally dangerous fauna of an untamed land. Surely this kind of man can reform and educate two average teenagers. Lois, send the boys to me immediately. Their education begins. Okay. Well... Five minutes later... Lois, we're sending the boys away! Away? But I just sent them to you five minutes ago. Have you failed to teach them? Oh, Lois, they're idiots. I might as well try teaching the badgers. I asked Bill Jr. to digest some facts about analytical geometry. He ate the book. Well, math was never his strong subject. Sounds like he will take well to biology. Or the culinary arts. Oh, Bill, what are we to do? We can't afford a European education on a physician's salary. No. The only option is Massachusetts. Huh? Couldn't the boys go to Harvard? Never! Never! Uh, I am a loyalist, a true loyalist, true to my loyalist ways. Besides, if we send them to a party campus like Harvard, it'll be nothing but keggers and road trips with their friends and all those souped-up, horse-drawn buggies that they like so much. There are a lot of bad crowds nowadays at Harvard, Lois. I, for one, don't care for that newfangled folk music that they like to listen to, either. What's, what's so wrong with Bach? Let me ask you that. I just don't understand all that angry folk music. I won't even mention that alluring revolutionary war. Bad influences all around. I know, but then what is to be done, Bill? The boys must be schooled. Well, we could send them to Nova Scotia. <laughs> <laughs> I felt like we needed something to cut the tension. Oh, that was wonderful. Oh. <laughs> You're the, hard. the influences on these immigrants who represented a reasonable cross-section of uh, colonial culture were both British and American. Education was one of the tools, then, uh, by which they hoped to recreate a more ordered, respectful, and conservative society in New Brunswick. It is important to remember that the very existence of such an institution in 18th century New Brunswick was a remarkable achievement, and one that would eventually lead to the development of a major university which has served this province for more than 225 years. Lois, I have had an idea. We need to think about the future of this great province. We need our own center of higher education. 
Because when you're trapped in the endless struggle with relentless, unyielding nature and world-altering global politics, the one thing you're going to want is a post-secondary education. Oh, what a wonderful idea, Bill. Perhaps you could discuss it with some of your friends from the club. Yes, Lois. I might just do that very thing. In fact, I think I'll write it down in letter form. Wonderful. Oh. Just some thunder and lightning yes. rolling through the dangerous province that we live yes, in. Yes, hopefully to blow away some of that underbrush. Oh, the oh, underbrush is so thick, even not even that. Uh, I mean, there was a hurricane that was Well, you know what? If you write your letter, you're going to want to forward it to Governor Carlton before the vacation season arrives. Oh, yes. Oh, when there's a ribbon to be cut, you can't move two feet for all the public officials. But come June 1st, you'll be wondering where there's any existing at all. <laughs> Good point, Lois. I better jot this down quickly with my eye quill. Oh, here. Use mine. Ooh, that, uh, that's different than my eye quill. Yes, it's my new eye quill four. In the sense, in the sense, of course, that I own four quills. Oh. It's 3G. What does that mean? I have no idea, but it gets great coverage. <laughs> well, put on a pot of tea, Lois. I've got some writing to do. Certainly. Now, fresh paper, where to begin? Where to begin? The petition was not unlike that signed in 1783 by a number of loyalists while awaiting evacuation from New York City. The petition asked for the establishment of an academy in Fredericksburg, which had been selected by Carleton earlier in 1785 as the site of the province's capital. Its favorable reception may have been aided uh, by a memorial from the principal officers of the disbanded corps of loyalists and other inhabitants urging the government to set aside land for the use of the proposed academy. It also didn't hurt that Bill, for whatever reason, considered himself to be quite the skilled writer. <clears throat> from Dr. William Payne. Not a specialist. That's enough. <clears throat> The Woods near St. John, New Brunswick. Postal code A1. Two, Governor Thomas Carleton, the other side of the woods near St. John, New Brunswick, December 13th, 1785. Dear Tom, it's a little informal. Dearest Thomas, Awfully romantic. <laughs> to whom it may concern. Oh, no, that's distant. Distant. Ah, ah, I have it. <clears throat> to His Excellency Thomas Carleton, Esquire, Governor, Captain, General of the Province of New Brunswick. Have enough titles, Thomas? Okay, uh, on we go. Your memorialist beg leave to represent and state to your consideration the necessity and expediency of an early attention to the establishment in this infant province of an academy or school of liberal arts and sciences. Uh, it's coming off a bit wordy. Yeah. Uh, no stopping now. Onward, Payne, onward. Your Excellency need not be reminded of the many peculiarities attending the settlement of this country. The wolverines are particularly thick, and I won't even mention the underbrush. Oh, oh don't the even underbrush. bring it up again. Ah, it just depresses thick. me. Thick and it's unnecessary is what it is. That's what it is. Uh, but we digress. Uh, the settlement of other provinces has generally originated in the voluntary exertions of a few enterprising individuals, unencumbered, and prosecuting their labor at their leisure, and as they found it convenient and most for their advantage. I've even heard that Quebec has two croquet lawns. How lovely for them. Next paragraph. Far different is the situation in which the loyal little adventurers here in New Brunswick find themselves. <laughs> many, upon, uh, many of them... Many of them, upon removing, had sons. Venal rascals! Bill! Oh, sorry. Eraser, 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 eraser. Sons whose time of life uh -huh, and former hopes call for an immediate attention to their incarceration. Ooh, no, no. <laughs> nice, but wishful thinking. Uh, education. <laughs> 
Ah, uh, yes, immediate attention. Many public, oops, public spelled with a K. Oh, take no notice, Payne, you're on a roll. Many public advantages and many conveniences would result to individuals could this be affected within the province. Our memorialists do therefore most earnestly request your excellency will be pleased to grant a charter for the establishing and founding of such an academy that proper persons be appointed trustees and duly authorized in a corporate capacity to superintend the etc, uh, etc. Uh, et and now the big finish. <laughs> Be firm, pain. Be firm, but fair. Ask, but never beg. That land be granted to erect proper buildings, and other land be granted and appropriated for the use of the academy. Particularly, they pray for a part or the whole of the reserved land in the neighborhood of Fredericksburg. A name so perfect, it will live unchanged for all eternity. Your memorialist will not trouble you with any scheme or plan of the charter prayed, but submit the whole to your judgment. As in duty bound, signed, Dr. William Payne. Mm. Enough. P.S. Any breakthroughs on dealing with the underbrush? Oh, oh the underbrush is so I heavy. You brought it up in the letter. I don't have shoes you have for to let it. it. That's the you problem. Need to let I need hiking boots. You need to let it go. All right, Phil, there. I'm finished. I'm finished, Lois. I am finished. I'm heading out tonight to men's club. Okay, Bill. Please be back by June. June? Fine. I guess it's going to be a short trip for me. Oh, Bill, don't forget the petition. Lois, I just wrote the petition. I'm not likely to forget the petition. <clears throat> Lois? Yes? Have you seen the petition? Oh, did you check your coat pocket? Ah, there it is. <laughs> You're an angel. I know. <laughs> oh, Bill, don't forget to have the men sign it. Lois? I... Yes, dear, of course. Thank you very much. Bill? Yes? Take the trash out when you leave. And so, as William Payne left his home that day, the trash in one hand, a petition in the other, the path of higher education was set that day in St. John, New Brunswick. That the original academy survived during those difficult early years is attributable in large measure to the vision and commitment of a number of very determined individuals. The signatories to the original petition of 1785, William Payne, William Wanton, George Sproul, Zephaniah Kingsley, John Coffin, uh, Ward Chipman and Adino Paddock, as well as from Governor Thomas Carlton and later Lieutenant Governor Sir Howard Douglas, and also James Somerville, the first and only president of the College of New Brunswick. What the institution they founded has become is not perhaps exactly what they had in mind, but surely they would take enormous pride uh, in what they had accomplished and in what it continues to represent in the life of the province, which they also helped to found and to shape so skillfully.